Well, hello, everybody. I'm Leslie Korn, and welcome to our brief presentation today on my certification program. And I'm going to share with you a little bit about the role of nutritional therapy and why I think it's the absolutely most important missing piece in trauma treatment today. I'm going to have a brief presentation. I'm going to hopefully tweak your interest in some different ways of incorporating nutritional therapy. Last week, we covered the scope of practice and ethics and why most of you will be able to do this. All of us can do this work. It's just a question of to the extent that we do it and that's defined by the states. And if you miss that presentation, that talk, and also the answers to my questions that uh, came through from all of you, then um, check out that link. I think it's a YouTube link and Rachel can share that with you. So for those of you who don't know me, I have a doctorate in applied psychophysiology, also known as behavioral medicine. I also have a master's in public health where I studied nutritional therapy and um, I've been a psychotherapist, a licensed mental health counselor for over 35 years. I've had the honor of doing over 75,000 clinical hours. I began at the age of 23. I'm certified and licensed in body work. I was one of the founders of the National Certification Board and proved clinical supervisor. And most of all, I've had an enriching and rewarding career doing integrative medicine and functional nutrition. Uh, I've studied internationally and practiced internationally, and I have a, a special interest in indigenous healing systems and live and work uh, most of the year in Mexico and in rural Mexico with indigenous communities, as well as in the Pacific Northwest. These days I've got a virtual practice in mental health nutrition. I work with people, 90% of whom have experienced either PTSD or complex trauma, who have both a combination of emotional distress and dysregulation challenges, as well as um, physical issues, could be autoimmune disorder, digestive problems, sleep, depression, anxiety, panic, um, breathing challenges, uh, it, it really runs the gamut, as you well know, working with uh, complex trauma survivors. And I also have a special practice in helping people reduce or eliminate their medication usage, particularly for the symptoms of trauma. So really overall optimal wellness and really helping people take control of not just their emotional well-being, but their physical well-being. And that's what I help them integrate and help them figure out all the connections. Because as we know, so many people come to us and aren't always aware of the traumatic events that underlie and undergird their various symptoms. And many of our clients are going to several providers, some to deal with pain, some to deal with digestion, some to deal with emotional distress. And yet they really are going to benefit from someone like us who can help them connect all of those pieces and understand how they're just different symptoms and manifestations of the same types of dysregulation that we can address through uh, an integrative approach. And I wanna share with you, uh, Rachel, if you share our lead slide and then we'll go on to Brainbow Blueprint. This, here's our title. And I think above all, I love this image of the heart because above all, we are about heart and heartful connection with people. That to me is the, the true ingredient for health and helping and healing. And then we've got a variety of methods and techniques that are going to address the needs of our clients. Uh, next slide. So if we think about integrative approaches, I, I don't wanna repeat what I said last week in case some of you were here last week, but this is the Brainbow Blueprint. And you can see all of these different methods that help us integrate all the needs, the real holistic needs of our clients 
ranging from their individuality and that there's no one right diet for everyone. And when I use the word diet, I don't mean diet to lose weight. I mean food. Um, this is not about, um, you know, losing weight. This isn't about body shape or size. This is about what's optimal and what makes me feel the best and what fuel nourishes my engine because my engine may be different from your engine. And so I teach you how to begin to understand that. And that's both an art and a science. And then we go on from there with integrative assessments and uh, with um, biological rhythms and understanding how trauma is in essence a disruption of rhythm, of biological rhythms. And those of you, thanks for your great feedback on my book. I've written about all the variety of rhythms that really become disrupted in trauma and then how integrative approaches can help rebalance those rhythms. And in this particular course and in this talk, there are so many interventions we can use nutritionally to balance biological rhythms. Uh, number one is melatonin and number two is vitamin B12. Just those two interventions can be very helpful in balancing the clock that gets disrupted in trauma. And then we go on from there uh, in all of our methods, nutrition and culture and the value of culture, working cross-culturally. And those of you that are working across cultures, food, nutrition, herbs, people love to talk about this. They love to talk about their recipes. They love to talk about what they're cooking. They love to go to healthy cooking classes with yoga and food and then process work about what's getting in the way of their self-care because trauma, if it's nothing else, is a dis-ease, meaning being out of ease with self-care. And this is where we play such an important role in helping people come back to their self-care or perhaps even learn about self-care, learn about what they need for the first time in their lives. And that is where nutrition can be part of that, meaning how am I nourishing myself? There are so many ways we nourish ourselves and nutrition is just one of them. Preparing food is one of them. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. So as you go around this whole rainbow blueprint, this is how I organize uh, the certification. In fact, all three of my certifications, and I know some of you have already taken uh, some of them. And uh, this latest one on trauma is uh, perhaps the piece de resistance, shall I say. Um, I'm trained as a traumatologist and it's my passion really helping people uh, survive and thrive. And that's not to say that there are necessarily miracles, but I guarantee you, if you're not already incorporating the role of digestion, mindful eating and nutrition in your practice, whether you're doing it directly or you're collaborating or making referrals, I promise you, you will get a hundred percent more and better outcomes by doing so. And um, you will bring the art and the heart that you already bring to all of your work to this as well. Because our work in nutrition is really analogous to our work in psychotherapy. And it's not ideological. There's no one right approach for everyone. Just like there's no one right method, might be EMDR for one person, CBT for another, ACT for another, psychoanalysis for another. And that's where we bring our broad knowledge of our methods to understand what our client will benefit from and at what stage they are and how they'll benefit from that. So take some time to look at the rainbow. And I think the previous talk that I gave, I, I talked about it a little bit more uh, going through the whole circle. And of course, I cover it in depth in the training. Rachel, next slide, please. Because now we'll get into, shall I say, the meat of the matter or for our vegetarians, the tofu of the matter. All right. So I want you to leave here today with 10 
things that you can do right away to help people improve their mood with food. And um, if you're not already doing this for yourself, I encourage you to. And then I'll open it up to any questions you have. They can be far and wide because uh, we'll have a little time to address your questions. Right away, I begin with educating my clients that the kitchen is their pharmacy. So many of the medications we use come out of the natural plant and food world. And so I want to raise awareness. And isn't that what we do as counselors and therapists, nurses and healers? We are raising awareness and creating connection between what am I eating and how is it making me feel? And especially with trauma, where so many of the symptoms are dissociative. Eating disorders are essentially a dissociative disorder. The addictions are dissociative. Even pain is dissociative. The inability to say, I don't know what I need right now. I don't know what my body is trying to tell me is in essence dissociative. So at its essence, we're bringing awareness. We're helping people come into their body, experience their bodies through a variety of means. And that includes experiencing how do I feel after I ate that particular food? And there's no judgment about any foods per se. I think you'll see later in this list that perhaps the one no-no is sugar. We know that sugar is poison. Dr. Lustig, an eminent endocrinologist, does not mince, pardon the pun, mince his words. Uh, Dr. Lustig would also agree with me, sugar is poison. And it's probably the number one thing that we need to stop eating in order to feel better. But Aside from that, most all foods are going to be healthy for you if they're the good quality foods. So I teach about this and talk about this because so often people think when we talk about nutrition, there's this saying that asking someone to change their diet is like asking someone to convert to a new religion. But this is non-ideological. Some people are going to really feel good digesting beef and some people are going to really enjoy beets. A lot of people are going to enjoy uh, arugula and then some people won't. And so the idea is that we release ourselves from the myths of what a good diet is, uh, release ourselves from shame, release ourselves from any ideology and really learn the science of foods and how the kitchen truly gives us so many nutrients, anti-inflammatories, antioxidants, uh, ginger and turmeric, powerful anti-inflammatories that we can use daily in teas or in our pre preparation of foods to reduce pain and thereby reduce the use of NSAIDs. And that's so important because NSAID use is so harmful to the liver. And so we can see these cascading effects that if we can backtrack with a client to begin to engage everything I'm preparing and eating in my kitchen is actually healing and helping that we're working at so many different levels of consciousness along with biochemistry. We're going to start to turn around the many diverse symptoms our clients experience. Food preparation is really mindful self-care. And that's how I frame it. Many of my clients say, oh, I don't have time to prepare food. I'm too busy or it's too expensive. I'd rather buy some tacos on the street or a, a hamburger at McDonald's. So again, I'm in the role of educator. I want to inquire what foods they like, what they're missing. Might they get a $30 crock pot? And would they love to make a uh, chicken broth or beef stew or uh, Boston baked beans like where I'm from? Delicious beans that are pinto beans that are so rich in folates, which are mood boosters. And you can add a little bit of blackstrap molasses to that. And you start to convert the addiction to white sugar, to some healthier sugars. So it's not that you go without the sweetness of life, 
but you can start to change your options and you've got wonderful B vitamins and iron and blackstrap molasses. So we can begin to build a repertoire one dish at a time, maybe one day a week, maybe the kids participate, maybe the kids participate in going to the store and picking out some of their favorite fresh fruits and vegetables. So this is a family affair as well, or if people are living alone, we engage others as well, friends, family, um, in person or even over Zoom. So we're applying so many skills we already have to jumpstart self-care. And becoming aware of how mood follows food, one of the first things I introduce you to in the course is the food mood diary. And it's a simple way where people write about what they eat every day, and then keep track of how they feel. Are they feeling energized with their diet? If you're like me in my practice, people are coming in very stressed. Um, oftentimes they've got lots of gas or discomfort. They're fatigued. They're fueling themselves on lots of coffee, oftentimes lots of refined sugars. Uh, they're kind of just getting through the day. Um, maybe they're not complaining too about all their physical health problems, but then they're saying that their mood is labile or maybe they're depressed, maybe they're anxious, uh, they're not sleeping well. These are all of the emotional sequela we're seeing. You don't need to be traumatized uh, to be feeling all of these, but since most of my clients have histories of trauma, this is quite often how they begin to come. And so I want to work with them to identify how they feel after they have that donut and third cup of coffee and their stomach is gurgling and how we begin to reduce this addiction truly to sugar and stimulant foods. And this is analogous to our work with reducing the addiction to stimulants or overstimulating behaviors or um, exposures in the world that are just going to reinforce overwhelming events. And so this is where I begin is just some awareness. I notice that you're only drinking one glass of water a day. It might be that your headaches are due to dehydration. And I teach them the pinching exercise. And indeed, one glass of water a day or two cups of liquid would be dehydrating, a cause of headaches leading to NSAID use, leading to pains in the gut, leading to antacid use, and on and on it goes. So we are really unraveling or peeling back like the onion a lot of these causes. And that's really so much of what I want to share with you is getting to the root cause, not the symptoms, but really digging into where does this all begin and let step by step unravel it. So food prep and eating is also socially self-regulating. We do a lot of work around bagel regulation, around parasympathetic dominance. And we know that being together, which has really been hampered during the pandemic, we, we regulate together through food, through gathering, through preparation. In many ways, it's become a lost art with our very busy modern lives. But this is something I work with my clients to cultivate again and even offer them opportunities in my clinical practice where we do uh, day-long groups, uh, workshops or 90-minute or groups where people share potluck, they share recipes, they share their stories, they work on adherence and strengthening that self-care muscle. So many opportunities for you to creatively incorporate this into your practice. Even something as simple as chewing as a mindful activity. When we eat a carbohydrate, we release amylase in the saliva. You know, when you're smelling something delicious and you start to feel your saliva flow, we've got enzymes there that start to break down the carbohydrates. But if we don't insalivate it enough and we just swallow it whole, as many people do under stress and traumatic experiences, then we're not really 
giving it the enzymatic action it needs to fully break down. And then it leads to a whole cascade of digestive problems. So one of the simple things you can do with clients is a mindful exercise. I keep a bowl of raisins in my office and, uh, or maybe cacao nibs. And I just ask someone to put it in their mouth and feel it, feel the texture, feel the sweetness, roll it around and just become aware of that sensation. And then I ask them to carry that mindful exercise through to when they're eating at home, to sit and relax before they eat and then to consciously become aware as they're chewing to really break down the food and salivate it. You know, the old macrobiotic theme of chewing each bite a hundred times until it's liquid really was based on this mindful concept of insalivating the enzymatic action so that you improve your digestion. This is a simple psycho nutritional educational insight that you can share with your clients as a first step and becoming aware of how you are using stimulant foods stimulant foods like coffee i've got a saying i'll share with you coffee is a drug it's not a beverage so use it wisely coffee enhances dopamine it improves mood enhances focus enhances peristaltic action the the undulating uh, muscular action of the colon to release waste. It is rich in polyphenols, so it's an antioxidant. We know that it's protective of neuronal function. However, you use too much of it, we slip over that side of the mountain into insomnia, anxiety, uh, too much acid in the gut. And this is the principle that I teach throughout this course, whether we're talking about nutrition or herbs or body work, yoga, just the right amount and the right approach for the person at the right time. And so coffee can be a wonderful natural stimulant with therapeutic effects, but many, many people use too much of it and have the negative side effects. And so I work with people to ascertain if that's so in their lives. And it's not just some coffee. Caffeine is often found in Coca-Cola. I've worked with a lot of people who weren't even aware of the effects of how much Coke they were drinking and how it affected them. Again, simple psycho-nutritional educational tips that begin to enhance awareness and help our clients uh, strengthen their self-care muscle and become aware of how they're treating themselves. Recognize that foods can be used for healthy self-medication or unhealthy. There's nothing wrong with self-medicating. There's nothing wrong with saying, I'm feeling anxious. I need to drink some chamomile tea. I'm feeling anxious. I need to go out for a run. I'm feeling kind of low mood or fatigued. I need a pick me up. I want uh, some healthy cocoa. The challenge is, are we self-medicating with healthy foods? And I promise you, there are a multitude of healthy substitutions for the crap foods that we can eat or that our clients can eat that really fulfill the purpose of healthy self-medication. It's not about abstinence. It's not about being an ascetic. It's not about um, sitting in a cave and doing without. It's about enhancing quality, enhancing self-care through good choices that help us feel better in our daily lives. And this is really our goal in working with people who are feeling really poorly uh, in their lives. And I promise you, where there is poor digestion, there is poor mental health. And where there is poor mental health, there is poor digestion. I promise you, every one of your clients has a digestive problem. Unless you're a um, maybe a fitness coach or a healthy coach who's working to enhance optimal wellness and there's no depression, anxiety, panic, insomnia to begin with, then 
maybe someone does not have a digestive problem. But I promise you, and I'll teach you how to recognize this, any step along the way, anyone with mental distress has digestive distress. Thereby, if you improve digestion, you're going to help someone improve their mental health. No, not many people know this connection. And so this is often a true revelation for people. I had a client walk into my office recently, really my Zoom office, and said, how come no one ever told me about this approach? So just think about your clients and what you know about them and what you know about their digestion. And maybe they've never shared that with you. But I'll show you how to ask those questions ask about their digestion, those questions appropriately and scope based and, and ethically based. So I've already gotten to sugar. It's the biggest culprit and uh, sugar is addictive. There's no question about it. And sugar can create uh, extensive uh, behavioral issues. Most importantly, from, from my experience in the literature, scientifically will bear this out, Sugar is what's called a pro-inflammatory food. That means it adds inflammatory process to the body. And we know through scientific research that depression and anxiety is essentially an inflammatory disorder. Disorder, meaning being out of order, out of balance. And so if we can decrease the inflammation in the body, then we can decrease depression and anxiety. It's going to be a complement to all the work you're already doing around depression, learned helplessness, anxiety, and more. When we do this, we help people reduce the pain medications. We help people reduce uh, what's often an addiction to NSAIDs or even worse, the opioids uh, and the opiates. So many of our clients have been traumatized, not just from interpersonal trauma, but from exposure to war, exposure to IEDs, uh, exposure to accidents, um, that create inflammatory process in the body. And that's part of the depression cycle. And that's not to say that people aren't depressed because of the chronicity of the dis-ease or the disorder itself. So we're really looking as clinicians to round out where we can intervene in this circle of distress to help people feel better and educate them to do so. One of the principles that I teach about quite a bit is called the principle of substitutions. I already touched on it a little bit when I said a healthy cocoa. There's no reason why you can't enjoy delicious sweet chocolate. I love to use organic uh, cocoa. I can sweeten it with a little honey. I can sweeten it with a little stevia. If you like a nut milk like almond or if you like seed milk like hemp milk or even rice milk, you can even use a full fat cream in that um, cocoa. Now that I'm describing my recipe to you, I want to go make it a little later. People gravitate towards chocolate because it's rich in magnesium. It's also rich in uh, theophylline, which is a mood booster. So coffee, as you, uh, not coffee, uh, chocolate, as you know, it boosts our mood, but it's also deeply relaxing at the same time. And it really stimulates our dopamine, which helps us focus. It's often why we want to have a chocolate bar in the afternoon. But one of the things I teach my clients is how to make healthy cocoa or even healthy chocolate almond joys. And we have a whole session where we teach chocolate making for kids and families to make delicious, healthy chocolate, almonds, coconut. What better food is there but without refined sugar? This is one example of the principle of substitutions that I teach about. It's about understanding what we crave, what our brain wants for its fuel, and then making choices that are actually healthy for us and not just feeding addictions or are feeding pro-inflammatory process in the body. 
and I cover a whole range of the neurotransmitters and the kinds of moods that we want our foods to either stimulate or help sedate. And then finally, I think our principle is that we have to enjoy ourselves. I think trauma is in so many ways, um, it takes away the enjoyment, the joie de vivre, the purposefulness, the meaningfulness, the sense of connection, uh, the sense of um, action. And we're working at so many levels, but one of them also includes enhancing the capacity to enjoy once again, and to enjoy and taste foods and herbs and plants and all of the gifts that nature has given us. Uh, enjoy our movement. And that also includes our bowel movements, our musculature, our digestion, to really come back in and enjoy our bodies because so much of trauma is inflicted via the body. It's truly the quintessential mind body and spirit dis-ease, being out of ease. And so there's no shame about anything that we're doing in this approach to integrative medicine and nutrition. It's about becoming aware, what do I need for myself at this stage in trauma recovery and collaborating to achieve that step-by-step step at the pace someone is ready and willing to go. So that's a little taste, another pun, forgive me, a little taste of the course and why I think this is such a missing piece that uh, is so important for us to integrate. It's why I now devote my practice full time to this approach. All right, there we have it. Uh, final slide, Rachel. Thank you so much, Rachel, for facilitating this talk. I've got a bunch of books there for you to look at, and I'll let you look at them. If you go to my website at drlesliecorn.com, I've got lots of free recipes, handouts, blog material, uh, some excerpts from our uh, courses so that you can um, uh, forage, shall I say, and see what might resonate with you. All right, let's take a look at some questions. And I think Rachel's going to share those with me on the screen. <laughs> Not related to nutrition, but I have to say, I love those earrings. I assume there's significance in Mexican culture. <laughs> Thank you for saying that, Rachel. Can you everyone see them? They are significant. They were a gift to me by a Huichol indigenous person, also called uh, Huixarica. And what you see here is this little round peyote button. And as you know, in this course and in all of my courses, I teach about psychedelic medicine and its treatment and the certification for trauma. And peyote is used for the treatment of trauma, in particular, the treatment of addictions. And the Native American church is approved by the U.S. government to carry out peyote ceremonies, and they accept um, particular people who are referred to them, uh, who are there to uh, overcome alcohol or drug addiction. And, you know, there are so many theories about how psychedelic medicine works and far beyond our time today, but maybe we'll touch on that in another talk some week. Um, I do cover that in a module. But besides the biochemistry of it, I'm very concerned about the fact that these profound spiritual experiences that are engendered by psychedelic experiences that are undergone as part of ritual um, and healing process really reignites what I was just talking about earlier, the sense of connection, meaning, purpose, the greater uh, aspect of life that is so trod upon as a result of particularly complex trauma. But I think I've seen it in war when we think about war trauma or moral injury, this kind of sense of 
disconnect. So I know I'm waxing on <laughs> out of this earring question, Rachel, but that's what these are. They're peyote button representations. And we learn so much from indigenous cultural practices and that's why I value them and teach about them too. So thanks for that. <laughs> I know some of you are freezing right now, but we're at 80 degrees where I am. So I've just turned off the AC. For clients who are skeptical or reluctant to integrate nutrition into their treatment, what are the top strategies you recommend? Well, I want to know a little bit about why they're skeptical or why they're reluctant. It may be that they're not ready. Let's accept that this is not going to be right for everyone or they're not ready for it. Uh, and that's okay. Um, because oftentimes as we work with people uh, and the bond and the rapport and the trust develops, they do become ready. And that's what I've seen. So I think we have to accept number one, not everyone, this isn't going to be right for everyone or at this stage. Um, or that it evolves as we work with them. I want to understand if it's that they may not be aware of the connection. And if that's the case, we may just look at, are they, what's the connection between what they're eating and what some of their symptoms are? For example, are they drinking five cups of coffee a day and are they anxious? Then I might say, you know, there's good research that caffeine can contribute to anxiety. I've got some ways for you to decrease uh, the coffee intake and, and provide some alternatives. Uh, and I explore with them. Usually the reason they're drinking so much coffee is they're fatigued. And they're fatigued because trauma is deeply fatiguing to the adrenal glands. And so we kind of explore. I think what I'm suggesting the direction that you can go in is increasingly integrate the story of the body and the symptoms of the body into your work. And that's really what I teach you how to do. I could probably talk for another hour about how to address reluctance, but I hope that gives you just a little bit um, to go on. Okay, uh, next question question. Anything, any other questions? Is that it, Rachel? Okay. Well, there we have it. Um, I welcome hearing from you. Uh, I think we've got lots of resources for you to uh, look at and read about. And uh, I just... We'll look forward to seeing you in the course room. 